Good afternoon and welcome to our ANA Live. We are very glad to welcome Dr. Thomas Rowland and Dr. John Golfinos from NYU Langone Medical Center. We're happy that you could join us today. And doctors, I'll let you introduce yourself in just a second, but first let me handle a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you have questions, if you're attending and you have questions during the presentation, you're welcome to type them into the comments section. And once Dr. Roland and Dr. Golfinos are finished with their presentation, we'll have a Q&A session to answer those questions. Uh, also, this presentation is being recorded and will be housed in the video library on the ANA website. I'll type that address into the comments section. It's a really great resource for everything um, acoustic neuroma related. And also, I want to quickly announce that our AN Awareness Week will take place this year from May 9th through the 15th. So keep an eye on our social media pages and on our website for details on how you can get involved in that. Okay, Dr. Roland and Dr. Golfinos, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves? Um, Dr. Roland, if you want to go first. Sure. Uh, thank you, first of all, Melissa, for inviting us to um, do this webinar. Um, and I appreciate the um, importance of the ANA in helping uh, patients pre and post um, diagnosis and management with uh, acoustic aroma tumors. My name is Dr. Tom Rowland. I'm the chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, and also a professor in neurosurgery at the NYU Langone Health, NYU Grossman School of Medicine. And um, obviously I wouldn't be here if I hadn't been involved in acoustic aroma care for the bulk of my career. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm, thanks, Tom. I'm John Golfinos. I'm the uh, Joseph P. Ranselhoff Professor and Chairman of Neurosurgery here at uh, NYU Langone Health and the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Um, my background is actually the view out my office window. That's uh, sunrise. You're looking at the East River. Um, and basically, that's how early we get to work in the morning. Uh, I can't remember the last time I missed a sunrise, actually, but at least it's really pretty. So, um, and uh, I started here at NYU. I came straight out of my training um, at the Barron Neurologic Institute in Phoenix, came to NYU in 1995, met Dr. Roland that year. And um, 25 years later, we're still more than 25 years later now, we're, um, we're still working together, uh, especially on uh, acoustic aromas and other tumors at the skull base. I'm also currently the president of the North American Skull Base Association. Um, and uh, we actually are looking forward to having a live meeting in February, uh, if everything goes according to plan. Um, but that also involves a lot of education about acoustic aroma and is also uh, includes a lot of people who have been in, on the medical advisory board of the Acoustic Aroma Association and also have worked closely with the ANA. So very happy to be here. Well, thank you both. Um, I'm really grateful to both of you for being here and um, we'll go ahead and get started. As I said, we'll just um, run through a quick presentation and then we'll do a Q&A after that. So Dr. Roland, if you want to share your screen we can go ahead and get started. Okay, can you see that, Melissa? Yes, mm -hmm. we can, thank you so much. Good, well, thank you. So when Melissa reached out to us and said, would you um, be interested in giving a webinar? I thought a lot about it and I thought, you know, we could talk about the three different management plans for acoustic aromas or hearing rehabilitation or facial nerve issues or gamma knife versus surgery versus observation. But I thought a lot's been done on that. And this is a topic that has been a particular interest to me over, over the years, having seen patients and helping them uh, make decisions for themselves. Um, so I thought I would embark on this topic of how to choose or what are the components of a good acoustic aroma team. And so this is Dr. Golfinos and I right outside our operating room, also looking at the East River, unfortunately on a rainy day. Um, and we're probably managing something like this that you see on the right. So today's seminar will be on um, what are the components of a good team? And the format will be that I will introduce some concepts and ideas and I'll ask Dr. Golfinos to comment on it. So I'll in a sense act as a moderator and he will um, give his two cents about the things that we commonly deal with. So the first issue, and this is something very important to me, that there seems to be a heightened promotion and advertising uh, for cases going on. Uh, we see individuals promote themselves with very big claims that we do the most cases, we're the best surgeons in the world, we have the best outcomes in the world, we do radiation, which is best for everyone, our radiation is the best. 
Um, you know, this is kind of reminds like the Taco Bell commercial uh, uh, advertisement here. This is what's seen in the in the advertisements on the TV. And this is what you actually get from Taco Bell. And even this subversive advertising that Coca-Cola equals love. And of course, a uh, can, can, uh, an artist wrote uh, means profit, love profit. Um, we also see organizations promote teams. Um, sometimes you, the more you pay, the bigger your advertisement, the bigger your promotion is. Uh, there's even maybe a suggestion that the bigger your font, the better you are. Uh, those with big advertising budgets, you know, some medical centers um, have large advertising budgets, seem to send the most e-blasts and have the most advertising. There are other uh, teams that I'm keenly aware of um, around the country that don't advertise at all and don't pay for ads and are superb uh, doctors and acoustic neuroma surgeons and, and have superb teams. And lastly, we also have some patient uh, support groups promote teams. Oftentimes it's, it's done out of, you know, earnest caring that, you know, if I had a good experience, I wouldn't mind if you see the doctor that I had a good experience with or the team that I had a good experience with. So, um, so the, my first question to Dr. Golfinos is based on, on this slide. What, what, what feelings do you have about um, self-promotion and medicine? You know, I remember years ago reading that one of the early um, statements that doctors would read, you know, in the late 1800s and early 1900s is that, that they would not advertise and would never say anything bad about another physician. And I, that seems to all have all changed these days. Any comments? You know, I think that's it. I mean, I'm old, I'm old enough. Wow, that's scary. I'm old enough to remember the days when advertisements weren't weren't really allowed. And you know, now we've we've reached a point where you sit down for dinner and you you get an ad from a pharmaceutical company that mentions the the complications of their newest drug or their newest procedure. And you know, I remember when my my nine year old asked me what anal leakage was. Uh, because of the ad that was on the TV. So we've reached an era where I think, you know, the promotion has gotten out of hand. And I think the reason, there was a very good reason why they didn't have promotion um, years ago. And, and it was really the pharmaceutical companies that sort of tore that down so they could directly advertise to the customer. Um, and the reason they didn't have it is, is uh, exactly what you, what you would have predicted happened and what did happen is that people would make all kinds of claims which the medicine world is not until now, until really until the year 2020, 2021, really wasn't equipped to vet to say that this was true or not. So I think that's, that's the big danger of sort of a promotion in medicine and advertising in medicine that people feel free to say, what they're, say whatever they want. Uh, and then when patients are trying to, and we see this all the time in the office, when patients come to us and say, how do I know which surgeon to, to pick? Um, you know, we, we, we counsel them in the way that the ANA counsels them that, you know, don't go by uh, a patient, don't go by a surgeon quoting somebody else's results, ask them what their results are. And you see from the big teams and the big centers that they publish their results. So anyone can find them, they're publicly available in the literature. Um, and I think, you know, that's really for patients, that's really the only way to know um, that you're actually dealing with someone who's as good as their advertisement. I think it's, you know, I, I really do my personal belief is that it's a bit of a, um, bit of a disservice to our patients that, that, uh, you know, we sort of confront them with, with making them figure out who's, who really, you know, who really can do what they say they can do or not. So some of the potential issues with this uh, advertising is it can be very confusing to patients. They, you know, they may even call a surgeon, that surgeon may say disparaging things about another surgeon or another team. It's usually in an effort, you know, financially based enough to secure more cases. Patients will get very anxious about choosing the right team. They don't want to make a mistake. They're kind of vulnerable prey in a sense. And geography is important. You know, why should a patient fly from one, half, one side of the country all the way to the other side of the country just to have a procedure when right around you have five other amazingly excellent teams? The other thing you mentioned, John, is, you know, publication. But there are, you know, there are good teams and very good doctors that don't publish a lot and, and still have good teams and do a good job and are well-trained. Um, so I think that even makes it, it more confusing. Um, but I like maybe you could comment on this. I mean, how, how would you how would you talk to a patient who's now been around and met you know five different teams and they're just they're like this woman in this picture here that have some more questions than answers. The more people you talk to, the more questions you have. How do you help? How do you counsel that patient? How do you help them make that decision? What should they be looking for? So this happens to us in the office. I would say at least at least once a week at least every day when we're seeing patients. 
Um, in New York, there's five major academic medical centers. So often patients can get five opinions, you know, in a, in a cab ride, really. Um, so we see that a lot. And I sort of counsel them to, you know, to go to websites like the Acoustic Aroma, Acoustic Aroma Association, you know, third, third parties that don't have a vested interest in anything. Um, I think a lot of the, you know, the communication boards are kind of valuable at the ANA. Um, I've, I've seen them be very valuable to patients sort of trying to figure out their way because at least there's you know some discussion there on on uh, particular surgeons or individual groups or teams, um, and uh, and then I also you know sort of tell them to kind of use their gut a bit. I think once they've gone around and talked to a few surgeons, they really start to be patients become able to start to see the differences um, and become you know understand that that uh, you know when they they start to be able to hear between the lines, so they start to understand what the person is leaving out. And I think, you, you know, we'll talk about a little bit of that. You know, what are other ways to know that um, you're talking to people who really have done this a lot and really have the necessary experience? And I guess my other question is, you know, how do you, how do you say to a patient, you know, when they tell you this, this doctor said that you're not very good or you don't know what you're doing or you don't know how to do the procedure that needs to be done, what do you say to that patient? And, and secondly, would you ever say that about another physician? No, I mean, yeah, that's amazing, right? I mean, I would never, you know, those of us who do these cases realize that if you're uh, going to do really big cases like this, really delicate cases, that of course you're going to have complications from time to time. So to, you know, to say something about another surgeon, boy, I mean, I, that I don't do. Unless I know that somebody is out and out lying or, or um, you know, I just, it's not a, it's not my place to talk badly about another surgeon. What we do is hard enough. I don't think it's fair to confuse patients even more by saying something about another group. And then I think, you know, uh, the other thing you're saying is, um, you know, you had geographic travel and things like that. Uh, you know, neurosurgery, there are still some procedures in neurosurgery that you probably should travel halfway across the country uh, to get them done. Um, but those those numbers of procedures are getting smaller and smaller as, you know, as the, as the United States uh, accumulates a lot of really top-notch skull-based centers, um, you know, neurotology, neurosurgical centers. So, you know, it's down to just, um, there are really very few procedures that people might want to travel for. One of them would be an auditory brainstem implant, for example, because that takes a lot of uh, resources. And if you're going to do that operation, you need a whole bunch of people behind you that can do it and not many, not many institutions to really put that together. So what I'm hearing is there are many well-trained surgeons out there with very good skills and knowledge and have taken an interest in this kind of uh, management, this kind of disease management. And there are also many good fellowships. The fellowships in America are very competitive. Um, we get people from all over the world trying to compete for our fellowships. And many of our neurotology fellowships even go, um, people don't get in. There's, I think this year, 14 people didn't get into a training program just because of the competitive nature. And um, and so the best or the fanciest website, the more self-promotion, the most expensive advertising does not necessarily infer the best quality. You know, kind of, I like to always ask, and I gave this talk once when we were looking for certification of what is a skull-based surgeon, which was very difficult because it's multiple fields together, but who's an expert? It's a person who has a comprehensive and authoritative knowledge of, or a skill in a particular area. And all these other names have, um, have been uh, <laughs> ascribed to an expert. I once called Dr. Golfinos a pundit and he thought it was uh, a derogatory term, but it, it really wasn't meant that way. So, so who's better, Do uh, Messi or Ronaldo? I mean, who's the best? Who's the best soccer player here? <laughs> John? You can make a case for either one, right? I mean, they're both playing at the highest level of the game and they both have their own sort of, you know, take on the game. Uh, Messi is a close in dribbler and Ronaldo has you know, a much better header than Messi does and a much better and probably better shot, although Messi gets his off awfully quickly. So the point is they're both great and, uh, you know, but they're variations on, on greatness, really. I will say one other thing, Tom, you know, I'm always reminded from the person who trained me uh, who pointed out what it really meant to be an expert and to, and to have experience. And he used uh, the definition from Niels Bohr, the great physicist. Niels Bohr said an expert is someone who has made every mistake possible in a very narrow area. Um, and that's, that's kind of true about surgery. And the person who trained me sort of, you know, always told me, listen, I'm telling you all this and showing you this, so you don't have to make the same mistakes that I made because I made every mistake possible. So that, that's, what, that's what an expert is, somebody with so much experience that they've been through it all. 
complications happen and it's how one manages those complications either on the spot or, or down the line that, that's very, very important. Um, so let's go in, you know, what are some of the elements of a good team? You know, some of my thoughts were it, it often the first contact a patient has with the team is an office staff person. And I'm always surprised at just how mean sometimes doctors, office staff people can actually be, which you would think you're in the, uh, you know, they, they really haven't had the Ritz Carlton hospitality uh, course and realize we're in the people business. Uh, and also many good, good teams have a PA or an MP or somebody, we call them APPs these days, that interface with the patients and helps get questions to and from the doctor. We wanna make sure they have good and innovative radiology for um, studies and good at hearing and balance testing. We wanna have access to lower cranial nerve and facial nerve physicians that can help manage any problems there. Things like swallowing or voice disorders after giant acoustic neuroma management. Um, we wanna have teams that probably offer all the options to treatment, including radiation, surgery, and observation. I guess it's okay to have a radiation center that just does radiation if that's what the patient chooses they want. But in my opinion, I think teams that interact together, <clears throat> you see a picture of Dr. Konziolka here, and I probably initially thought it was, um, it was be a challenge to my practice if he came to NYU, but actually it just the opposite has, has happened. I've learned a tremendous amount from him and I think he's learned a lot from us and it's just amazing to have a team with that kind of capacity on it. We wanna have teams that have hearing rehabilitation and experience with all the options. Some people, even things like cochlear implant, ABI, bone, uh, bone conducting transfer devices like Baja and Asia are available. The surgical team, you know, who usually is head up by the neurosurgeon, neurotologist, but I sort of view my, my part as just being a, a manager. I'm just trying to get the best third baseman and the best for, first baseman on the team to do their best job. So we work really well together. You want to have interoperative monitoring to monitor hearing and facial nerve and brainstem function. That's usually a neurophysiologist or an audiologist. You want to have special anesthesiologists that are skilled at keeping a patient um, under anesthesia, but not paralyzed for monitoring purposes. Um, so th those are all things that I think that one should look for on a, pay on a team's website or when they're talking to their, their um, caretakers about what to expect. John, do you have any other comments on uh, what you view as the elements of a good team? You know, I think you brought up a lot of really great points here. And, um, and I, I think that patients tune into that quickly, that they, once they get to a, a large center, they realize that everybody they talk to has experience with acoustic neuroma specifically. Um, and I tell that to our patients all the time. You know, if we look good, it's because when you get to the floor, those nurses in the ICU have seen thousands of these. Those uh, critical care people are going to help take care of you have seen thousands of these vestibular schwannomas, acoustic neuromas. So, you know, they're, they're, they're ready for anything, really. And they, they have experience with uh, anything that could go wrong. And you brought it up before. I think the, the mark of a great team and a great institution is, is one that can rescue people when things don't go as planned. Um, and that's the difference between, you know, having great care available all the time uh, with expertise and, and not having it there. So I think uh, all, all of those are really great points. The other thing I want to say about um, having Dr. Kanzioka here uh, is exactly, you know, what you said. I think our, I think when patients uh, come to places like NYU or uh, other places, Mayo Clinic, for example, they realize that they're getting an opinion that, that really um, covers every possible way they could be treated. And I think that one of the warning signs is if you go to a place that really seems to have a vested interest in say surgery over radiation or only radiation over surgery. Um, that's not fair because the, you really, every, every tumor ends up being treated differently. Treatments vary according to size, according to whether the tumor is solid or cystic, according to whether the patient has other tumors or other things going on. Um, according to the patient's age, their their ability to go through a surgical procedure. So when you're when um, when the team is is uh, devoted to one specific uh, tactic, like surgery, for example, you know they tend to try and make that happen no matter what, even though the patient really is better treated by another um, you know modality like radio surgery or radiation. So I think you know having a team where everybody is an expert specifically in acoustic neuromas make, makes a, a a big difference. I think. Uh, and I see that also with a lot of the radio surgery institutions. They say, oh, we've done a lot of radiation cases, but not for vestibular schwannomas you haven't. And it really is more, how well do you know this disease more than anything? Thank you. The, this picture in the, in the top right sort of says it to me. This is one of our COVID floor teams 
during the peak of the COVID crisis when we only had COVID patients in the hospital, over a thousand patients and many, many, many in ventilators and ICUs. So we came to work for you, you stay home for us, uh, which I thought just said it very nicely, you know, practice social distancing and mask wearing. Um, and, and we're extremely proud of these people. Oftentimes these are neurosurgical or EDNT residents working in ICUs, taking care of patients during this terrible time. So what are essentials for the post-treatment success? Let's talk about, you've already made your decision and you've had your management. So some of the things I think about is continued good communication. There's gonna be issues when you come off of steroids, you get headaches, or um, maybe there's a question of a spinal fluid leak or the face starts to get weak when you didn't think it was weak when you left, or maybe you had hearing, then maybe one day your hearing might have started to go and you're worried. So I, I just feel like good communication and access, immediate communication access is very important, I think. And that might be via, via fellow. Some programs have fellowships, uh, a nurse practitioner, PA, um, who then can get immediate access to the doctor. Some rehabilitation should be available. You know, you might need some balance therapy. I generally don't put patients into balance therapy unless they're really dizzy or continued problems after a few months. Some patients that are really ill, people with giant tumors that might have hydrocephalus or whatever, might need to go right from the hospital to a rehab facility just for extra aggressive rehab in that first week to give them a jump start um, for going home. And then have hearing rehabilitation options available like I talked about before, that might be a cochlear implant, it might be a brainstem implant or hearing crossover options, uh, bone conduction devices. Like Dr. Golfino said, complications can happen and will happen. It's how we manage those complications that makes a difference. You know, without revealing too much, I can remember a case of a guy who had um, a big tumor and severe trigeminal neuralgia is about it, a rare complication. And I guess he was on more trigeminal neuralgia medicines than he let on. And about a third of the way into the case, uh, he developed a cardiac arrest. And the thought was that it had something to do with the anesthetics and the medications because he had no cardiac disease. And fortunately, we were at a big medical center, immediately got him taken care of. He survived, had a angiogram, had no cardiac disease, and came back another day off of those trigeminal medicines to get taken care of. Of course, that frightened everybody, but I was very happy that I had the team around me that could make sure that that, that didn't end up in a, in a very terrible situation. Facial nerve issues are not uncommon. They're less common than they used to be, I think, in the old days, but you wanna make sure you have the proper rehab people eye care people, reanimation teams if needed. Um, sometimes it's just watching and waiting and getting some therapy. Sometimes with very big tumors, we run into voice and swallowing problems. And but we they're rare, but we want to have access to teams that can help with that. And, and there are many others. So Dr. Golfinos, um, in terms of um, your experience in managing, you know, very complicated, difficult cases and what's essential for success, do you have any other comments? No, I, you really hit on some great points here. I, you, you'll remember a, a case, Tom, I think, somebody that was um, pretty well known to me and uh, actually had come here from far away because I had known, known this person before and uh, he sort of said that he would only let us do his surgery, so he came, came from pretty far away and, and he was set to fly back and called me uh, that night to tell me that he had a headache and just the way he was talking, I just didn't like it. And I don't know if you remember, we brought him in and it turned out that he had a pretty significant complication, fortunately, a temporary one. Um, and we were able to rescue that and, and uh, he did great and, and um, still doing great. It was fantastic. And, you know, he came back and said, I said, you know, I, in the future, I don't think you really need to, you know, fly from so far away. He said, no, no, I said the opposite. It's because you answered the phone and you took me seriously when I told you I had a headache. And if I'd been, I had the feeling that if I'd been anywhere else, they would have just told me to take some Tylenol and get on the plane. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, that communication is vital and, and it's really that feeling that, you know, if you call and you need to be heard that there's someone there that's going to hear you. Uh, and that, you know, is, I think is a, a real secret of success. I do. Uh, and then everything else you mentioned, just uh, expertise across the board. The other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, excellence attracts excellence. So when you, when you have been doing this for a while and you really get up to some uh, really great results and you, and you have good numbers and that tends to bring in the people who are also good at monitoring, who are also good at eye care, who are also good at reanimation. Um, so, you know, excellence attracts excellence. So it's not a surprise that, you know, the, the best centers really are, uh, have everything in one place, I think. 
So I think we'll wrap up with this, this slide and then go to question and answer. So some suggestions, I think it's very important, as Dr. Golfino says, to get to know the team that you'll work with. Are these caregivers the kind that you can communicate with, ask questions to, trust? Are they mature? Do they have experience? Um, there is honestly often no need to travel long distances as there are many great teams around the country. I was just thinking as I was waiting for this to begin, if I were in Iowa, where would I go? And if I were in Chicago, where would I go? And if I were in the Northeast, where would I go? And I, I could think of a team in any of these places, Southwest, that I would think would be excellent and I would trust my care with. You wanna have all your questions answered. You wanna use your support options, the ANA obviously, ANA USA, I guess I'll call it, because if you just Google ANA, a lot of other things come up. So make sure you Google ANA USA. Um, and other patients and family can be great resources. We have a cadre of patients, even many that have had complications, but have gotten through them nicely that are willing to talk with patients and help set expectations. And lastly, and I've seen this, people are told to go right from a doctor's office to the emergency room for admission for surgery. You should not feel forced into a quick decision. There are very, very, very few, very rare situations where an acoustic neuroma is an emergency. You have time. So ask your questions, get your answers, feel comfortable, get to know people, get different opinions. Time is on your side. John, anything else to add here? I think that's I think that's all great. I agree with every single you know bit of that. And you're right. I can think of great teams, you know, virtually in every state of the union almost. Um, so yeah, I think it's uh, for for this now. People have been doing it long enough. There's enough expertise that to think you have to travel long distances. That would be I mean that would be the vanishingly rare case where that happens. And I think I think you you know it's great advice to sort of get to know the surgeon. You know, feel like you really can communicate with them and that they're hearing what you're saying. They're listening to what you're saying and that when they're talking to you that they're really communicating they're not just sort of you know spewing out um, some facts or some numbers that they're really addressing your concerns uh, and 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 trying to i always i always try to make it so that the patient can understand everything that i understand about what we're going to do as much as that is possible uh, so i think that these are all great points and, and i agree and uh, yeah i don't think advertising is going to go away anytime soon which is kind of unfortunate um, but uh, I think, you know, everyone's getting much more sophisticated. People are, people are really smart. Patients are really smart. Um, and I think, you know, they, they can see through almost all of that. I think. Well, thank you, John. Um, and Melissa, thanks again for allowing us. I hope, um, we, you know, raise some important points and we're happy to, um, answer questions coming up. Um, this is our email addresses. If anyone wants to send us um, any questions or, or comments. Uh, did we do a good job or didn't we? Uh, this picture, by the way, is an audit a, a picture of an auditory brainstem implant in place, place bypassing the cochlea. I just always like that picture showing the brain and how we do that. Um, and this lower picture is the new NYU. This is our new Kimmel Pavilion. This is our old hospital, which is still up. Um, these are, these are uh, offices and radiation oncology. This is a brand new science building uh, that went up and um, off campus we have two other brand new facilities that um, so our dean did an amazing job and rapidly transformed our campus and there you can see the empire state building in the background with a view from the east river so thanks again i'm going to unpair my screen now okay thank you so much um dr roland and dr Golfinas. that was a lot of really um Really great information. We do have a couple questions and thank you. I want to thank you both for sharing your email addresses. We have a couple people who are asking for recommendations in different parts of the country. Um, our organization, we do have a healthcare provider list on our website, which is anausa.org. And you're welcome to check that out um, for, for um, centers that do treat acoustic neuroma across the country. But then um, if you want to reach out to Dr. Golfinos or Dr. Roland as well, um, certainly you are welcome to do that. Um, I wanted to, one thing I wanted to clarify, um, you referred to Dr. Kanziolko, who's a wonderful um, physician at your center, but I don't know that everybody knows exactly what he does. So can you sort of talk a little bit about how you two interact with him and, and what his specialty is? Sure, absolutely. So Doug Kanziolko is actually a neurosurgeon, uh, just like me, but um, early on in his career, he became really a specialist 
in radio surgery. So using uh, the gamma knife and using high doses of radiation at a single time and a single dose to treat uh, all kinds of things. And, and one of them is in fact benign tumors, including vestibular schwannoma. So I wanna say it was Hurricane Sandy actually, uh, 2012 when uh, Dr. Kondioka came to NYU and, um, and it was just sort of as uh, Tom Rowland said that it really helped uh, the entire, our entire efforts in treating patients with vestibular schwannoma. Um, that uh, you know, having expertise of that kind on the non on the radio radio surgery side just added to everything. I think you know really enabled us to to pick the right treatment for for the right patient. Um, so that's uh, and he's um, he, he also has a hundred other accolades behind his name, um, but it really is uh, terrific at what he does. Really is excellent. He's he's an excellent doctor, and we've worked with him a lot. I just wanted to make sure that people understood and kind of talk a little bit about how. Um, in neurosurgery and radiation and how your team sort of works together, because I do think that's a really important point. Um, how do you deal with patients who maybe were treated, who maybe live close to your area, who were treated somewhere else and then come back to you and are looking for follow-up? We have a specific question for someone who's on um, watch and wait and um, is wondering about virtual um, virtual uh, consultations and should she get her MRI and all that. But before we get to that, um, how do you handle patients who have been treated and they've been treated somewhere else, um, but they come to you for follow-up either for post-treatment issues that they are dealing with or anything like that? Uh, I'll take a stab at that. So first of all, that's not uncommon. We have patients mm -hmm. that have gone elsewhere for surgery from our area and actually have severe, serious complications um, and then fall back on our lap to take care of the complications. And I know there are some places that says, look, I'm sorry, but we didn't treat you. We're not taking care of you. And I just think that's probably unethical. This is a patient in need who needs your care. And so we will manage any patient that wants to come and talk to us and take care of us. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes they'll say, but why did they do what they did? Or why did this happen? And I can't always answer that question. Um, but I say, look, I, I'm not sure, but I will do whatever I can to help you get over this and to rehabilitate your problem. Um, if someone's on a watch and wait, I, I think interestingly, the COVID crisis has taught us there are some, some things that we can do on Zoom. You know, you could, I guess you could send an internist your lab results and your blood pressure, and he doesn't have much to look at. Maybe they'll even have like a home heart monitor. He can listen to your heart with some kind of uh, Apple device someday. But for us, it's very hard. We, we, we can have you smile and see what your facial nerves are doing. We can't do much else. Uh, so we base a lot of it on history. But for someone who's in a watch and wait pattern, I think um, telemedicine's amazing because all we really want to know is, are you doing okay? What does your hearing test look like? And what does your MRI look like? And you can just flip your camera around and go over the MRI with them and you can communicate with them. So, so um, yes, we people um, are more and more using telemedicine for some of those kind of, you know, just standard observation. Someone who's had treatment who's doing well, but just needs a yearly MRI for a few years. That's another great use of um, telemedicine. Now for the moment, insurance companies are covering the cost of telemedicine. Look, you have to sit in front of a computer and, and log on and take care of these patients and take, take the responsibility for the care, you know, medically, legally. So you should be, um, we should get reimbursed. And at the moment we're being reimbursed, but I hope that lasts because I think that's a great, and, and also because of telemedicine, there's some really amazing technology evolving where um, you know home devices, home robots are, can actually take information. There's even a, a little um, ear scope that does um, by made by a company called Depstick, which I think is the best. I use it in Uganda all the time where you don't have microscopes, but the patient can just sort of put it in your ear. I can take a look at their eardrum and see if their eardrum's healed and they can show me the picture. And so there are technologies evolving that will make telemedicine even more, more complete. That's great. Um would you suggest anything specific for somebody who's coming who has been on watch and wait and is looking for their MRI um, for the, you know, they should have that before the consultation, correct? And is yeah. there anything that they should tell the um, techs at the MRI, you know, anything specific that they need? Yeah, that's an important question. Yeah, the, the mistakes we see is that um, people, so to get your MRI, you have to go to the place that did it and, mm -hmm. ask, and you have to ask them for a copy of the MRI, not the report, you want the actual images. Um, currently, most places still burn that onto a CD. It's probably one of the last places where you'll find a CD uh, these days. Um, so you, know, you want to tell them to include 
every every image that they can basically whatever will fit on the cd which is usually at least two mri scans two full mris um and so uh with that you can just bring it in and then once it once um we can get into our office then we can upload it to our electronic medical record here you still cannot technically view mri scans across the medical records we can nowadays um uh, look at um notes or other you know other parts of the chart that were done in another institution that's available now if first you have to give permission for it um, but that is available now but right now we still can't necessarily look at the mris unless they're brought into our institution and uploaded into our system gotcha okay yeah i think i think to make the appointment efficient and useful come in with your mri and your audiogram if that's what's important and that way we can look at it together. We can compare it to old MRIs, look for growth or not growth or recurrence or not recurrence and make the uh, appointment useful and efficient. Okay. Um, early in your presentation, Dr. Roland, you referred to um, results from different teams around the country that that's available, that it's, you know, that big centers particularly will publish their results. We get that question all the time. Where do you find that information? I mean, we do encourage patients to ask the doctors, but is there a way to just find it? Well, look, you can put anything on a website. You can put your results on a website, but mm -hmm. that's not um, that's not reviewed, peer-reviewed, you know, vetted right. information. So right. peer-reviewed articles, we publish outcomes, we publish novel treatments, we publish new ideas. Maybe we change our approach to a really big tumor. Maybe we shunt or don't shunt. You know, all those things are generally vetted through retrospective studies and prospective studies and are published in publications like the North American Skull Base Society Journal, our neurotology journals, and the neurosurgical journals. Now that's challenging for a patient to go online and Google those things and try to make sense of the literature. So that's where you might want to come in with a few questions and maybe let the caregiver help you vet that literature. You know, what, mm -hmm. what is an expected facial nerve rate for a three centimeter tumor? What is the hearing preservation rate for a one centimeter tumor? You know, those kind of things. And, that, and every tumor is different just because a one centimeter tumor is very different from another one centimeter tumor. We, we, we see patients with five centimeter tumors in normal hearing and patients with two millimeter tumors in a dead ear. I mean, it's a, it's a funny, tumor that way and some of the reasons that people lose hearing. Um, so I think all that's information that's useful. Um, I don't, I'm not sure just looking at the website. I mean, we try to not put results on websites, you know, mm -hmm. we this and we have this preservation rate because I could write any number and I just, and, sure. that's vetted, and that's the trouble with Dr. Google and, and websites in general and promotion. So most good websites, if you look at them, are just informational and it's very similar information to what you folks already provide. Um, and I think that's very useful. Okay. I, think, I think what I see patients do, which I think is useful, is when they come in and, and have learned to ask, um, have you published your results? In other words, are they, and so they may not be able to interpret the literature as well as we can, obviously, um, mm -hmm. but they know enough that they know they're talking to someone who has done all this, who has published those things, um, as opposed to someone who says, well, the reported rates of facial nerve problems are the following. Yeah, okay. Um, we do have a question um, from a patient who's dealing with balance issues post-treatment, only three months though, post-treatment, um, and is um, and did have surgery, but is still struggling with balance and, and feels at this point like she can't drive and is just wondering if that's something that will, you know, will continue to get better over time, or is that something that is just going to remain as it is right now, three months post-surgery? Well, I think if at three months you're still having significant balance issues that you can't drive, then it should be investigated. And there are ways to do that. Um, so maybe there's still uh, one of the two vestibular nerves present and there are things mm -hmm. you can do about that. An ear that's deafferented does better than an ear that just has some partial distorted information going to the brain. Um, so you wanna sort of know what, you know what was done at surgery and what the outcomes were. Um, we have, you know, we have different therapies for different types of balance issues. If, if we can do vestibular testing and there's still some function on that, on that side, we might want to just ablate that function. You can use gentamicin or other procedures. Um, and then aggressive vestibular therapy. Walking, I think, is the best exercise. Walk and don't hold your net head straight. Look around, look at buildings, look at beautiful trees and birds and flowers and move around a lot. Just sort of get your brain compensated the, 
the brain amazingly does amazing job with distributor compensation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, do you see patients that, um, that have had radio surgery that um, continue to see growth in their tumor and eventually need surgery? And if so, what is generally the outcome there? So I'm happy to tackle that one. Um, <laughs> the, the failure rates of, of radio surgery for um, vestibular schwannomas vary according to a couple of things. And the, and the, clear, the clear story is still not fully known. Uh, one thing that seems to have emerged in the last few years is that tumors that are growing more rapidly before they're treated probably have a higher rate of failure. That said, the overall, if you look at five years after radio surgery, all comers, every kind of tumor, um, then you'll see uh, in general a 5% failure rate. So only 5% of patients will need to then have something else done, which most of the time is surgery. Very occasionally it's a repeat radiation. Um, uh, so, but it can be with larger tumors. So once you get up near three centimeters, um, where we, we don't even use radiation really in three centimeters anymore. Um, but once you get up near that uh, and it's a rapidly growing tumor, the failure rate can probably be as high as 10% still not 20%, it's not 30%. I mean, it's a very effective treatment. Then what do you do? Um, well, when we take them to surgery, uh, we've, it, we've found that as long, or our current thinking, which is still in evolution, uh, is that you know as long as it's been one single dose, sort of a radio surgery treatment, uh, we haven't had that much trouble. Um, whereas patients who've had four or five doses, or even the ones who've had 30 doses, that's more like radiation radiation. And those are the ones where we see more scarring, where we see more trouble um, taking the tumor off the facial nerve. And I will say, uh, we have evolved to the spot where we're willing to leave tumor along the facial nerve, even though this is a tumor that's already failed radiation. You might think, well, what if that little bit grows? But we haven't seen that. So it seems that, these, that the remnants that we leave behind have been treated enough that the surgery plus the prior radiation is enough to sort of kill them. And we see them sort of fade away with time. Okay. Melissa, we actually have that exact case tomorrow morning. Really? Radiation failure is our, yeah. our Wednesday morning case. So okay. it does it does happen. Um, mm -hmm. I think because we tend to get a lot of those kind of situations, we may see more than others. You know, and I think one hidden in your question is what are the outcomes and results? And I think mm -hmm. they're probably referring mostly not to hearing, but to uh, facial nerve issues. And generally, it's still pretty good. There are situations where we struggle where it's really stuck to the facial nerve. And like mm -hmm. Dr. Golfino says, we will leave um, small pieces on the nerve to prevent a permanent injury. Well, and speaking of the facial nerve, how often do you see um, damage just by the, from the tumor itself to the facial nerve where you're starting people, the patients are starting to experience numbness or pain or, or um, anything? I mean, basically, are there any signs? Um, maybe if you're, if you're watching weight and you're kind of trying to decide when to treat any telltale signs, particularly with the facial nerve, where you're where you're starting to see um, damage and progression and that kind of thing. I think it has to do mostly with size. Um, so if your tumor is big enough that you're feeling facial numbness or taste alterations or numbness in your cheek or your lips, then the tumor is pretty darn big and it's now pushing on the fifth nerve, the trigeminal nerve, which is sensation nerve. We rarely see um, facial nerve paralysis or facial weakness from an acoustic neuroma, even big ones. Mm -hmm. And when we do see it, we worry that A, could it be a facial neuroma and not an acoustic neuroma, which can happen. They look almost identical on MRIs, although there, there are some signs we can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. Or B, it's an aggressive tumor. In other words, if it's rapidly growing and there's facial palsy and hearing loss, we worry about maybe this is more than just a benign vestibular schwannoma, so that mm -hmm. needs to be attended to quickly. Um, but it's very rare in, in neurofibromatosis type two, which we also have a very large population of here at NYU. We do sometimes more often see facial nerve involvement, but that's probably because these tumors are collision tumors. It's a facial neuroma and a cochlear neuroma and a vestibular schwannoma all sorted together as one collision tumor. Mm -hmm. um, or these tumors tend to get pretty big and tend sometimes they grow fast, can stretch the facial nerve rather quickly and that can cause weakness. But seeing facial nerve weakness or facial nerve paralysis um, before treatment um, is a sign that of either really big tumors or there's something more aggressive about that tumor. So it should be discussed and investigated. Okay. Um, 
Or um, you talked about at the very end of your presentation how the patients have time. You have time to make a decision. Are there? Uh, do you see um, a lot of small tumors that just remain stable? They don't change over time. So NYU probably have. Is it published yet, Tom? I can't remember. It's about to come out. If it didn't come out already. Uh, Nicholas's paper. We have eighteen tumors that shrunk. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for the most part, though, I think, you know, when when we compiled that just recently this year, compiled sort of a, a whole bunch of um, patients who are on a watch and wait. And uh, it turns out if you measure the tumors carefully, so if you do it with a volumetric measurement, then that means outlining the tumor on the MRI. Now, now it can be done with artificial intelligence, actually, so the machine can get pretty good at outlining the tumor. Um, but if you do that and you look at them volumetrically, then it turns out virtually all tumors grow. Now, the difference is some of them just grow only a little bit. Um, so that these are the ones that previously would have been called stable, even though mm -hmm. if you really do the biometric measurement, it's not. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a good probably 20% uh, that just grows so slowly that you may never need to do anything about them. Um, but we, we, you know, all tumors, as far as we know now, it seems like all tumors do grow. And I think what we're most interested in now is identifying the ones that are growing faster than the others, because those really do seem to be a different treatment category. We also just... Um, we've been doing this long enough. We've now seen 18 patients with documented shrinkage, and even some of the tumors have gone away. They're usually in older patients, you know, all, over 70, although not all. And um, so there's something about either the tumor outlasts its blood supply or outgrows its blood supply or something immunologically happens. We're not quite sure. Um, we haven't found that those patients are taking aspirin or shark's cartilage or anything else. Um, so... Um, so we just published that as well. Um, okay. So, um, of course, everyone hopes that's in the watch and wait that their tumors shrink and go away, but that's very, very uncommon. Okay. What about um, symptoms um, with small tumors versus large tumors? Generally, you you do see small, you know, large tumors that are that are cause symptoms on occasion. I guess that's how they get so large. Is sometimes they just don't. But we hear from patients who have very small tumors who are really symptomatic. Do you, um, do you run into that at all? And, and why is that? Um, well, I'll just talk about, so if the symptoms are vestibular symptoms, that, that, that can, is understandable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just haven't compensated. Usually, almost every acoustic aroma patient, if you really quiz them carefully, they'll tell you at some point, in the past number of years, they had a, a period of time when they're a little dizzy. They got off a boat and took them a while to get their land legs back. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't playing golf all that well for that those six months. And then it got better. Whatever. There's something subtle about their balance mechanism. Um, but but you usually compensate. But the problem with a growing acoustic aroma, then the vestibular changes are ongoing. Every time it grows a little bit, there's more distortion of the information on that from that inner ear about rotation and acceleration. And so sometimes they, they have repeated episodes. Most in general don't have a lot of balance or, or vestibular symptoms pre-op. The other symptom would be tinnitus and hearing loss. And interestingly, there's not a great correlation between uh, size. In general, there is, but we have very, very small tumors with dead ears, as I said before. And you know, we've had people come in with five centimeter tumors and their presenting symptom is hydrocephalus. You know, like, mm -hmm. what about tinnitus? Oh yeah, I had a little bit of tinnitus. I didn't think it was anything. Or what about your hearing loss? I just thought this was normal aging, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. some denial, I guess. But um, so I, I think um, it's interesting. So if tinnitus is a problem, you cannot cure tinnitus by treating an acoustic neuroma. You can only make it worse because you're either going to lose more hearing or whatever. Now in general, it, uh, tinnitus tends, you know, once you have a fixed stable situation and not a changing hearing loss over time, whether it's no hearing or all good hearing, um, tinnitus tends to become more and more of a background issue. And there are other therapies to help people through managing tinnitus if it's getting the best of them and interfering with their state of well being. So mm -hmm. um, maybe John can talk about some of the other more serious symptoms that, that might arise from big acoustic neuromas. Yeah, I, the, the big ones I think are, are self evident, and those are, those are usually ones that um, are easy to identify and easy to handle. Um, and those are actually the patients who get better because just decompressing a big acoustic aroma will, will get rid of headaches, nausea, and things like that. 
Um, no, I think I think Tom's right. The big one that makes people sort of feel miserable is really the balance issues. And that also varies with, is it a superior nerve tumor or an inferior nerve tumor? That seems to make a difference because there are those the two different vestibular nerves. The other symptom that's sort of fascinating to me that I don't think we understand as well is patients often complain of a sense of fullness in their ear. Mm -hmm. For some patients, that's um, sort of more describing the hearing loss. It sounds like there's a pillow there or something. But for other yeah. patients, they really say that it's sore. I mean, it feels really full and, and almost hurts. It's an ache. Mm -hmm. uh, there, are there are very variable and few sensory branches of the facial nerve that, that serve that area around the ear canal and, and uh, especially in the ear canal. I guess that's probably what they're, we don't know, I mean, we don't, but there are certainly some patients whose predominant symptom is that sort of fullness. And that can yeah. be a tricky one, to, that can be a really tricky one to, to fix. Well, and we hear it from a lot of patients too who continue to have eye issues following surgery and who will like tear up when they chew yeah. or something like that, where there's just seems to be this confusion of the nerves and something that didn't used to happen now happens. Um, and recently, I think we had on our Facebook page, somebody said that they had the AN on one side and, and couldn't produce tears on the other side. So then it's just, you know, I think it's really confusing for patients um, why that kind of thing happens. Yeah, I would see that. Um, is what about hearing preservation, Dr. Roland? I think this is probably in your area. Um, is long-term hearing preservation a realistic goal for acoustic neuroma patients? And um, is generally surgery or radiation better at achieving that? Well, that's, there have been endless number of panels on this and discussions <laughs> and know. webinars on this exact topic. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering why someone's still asking the question. But I'll, <laughs> I'll, tell you the, I'll tell you my feeling is that in general, um, if you save hearing with um, surgery, um, that hearing will last a long time. There are some patients, I, I won't deny it, there are some patients that can have progressive hearing loss after surgery for reasons that are unclear. Might be mm -hmm. inflammatory processes, whatever. You know, we use medications and steroids and vasodilators and all that. There's also some data, and Dr. Golfinos can speak to this, that after gamma knife that that next morning your hearing preservation rate is usually a hundred percent but what's the long term at what point in time and there have been some nice published data from the mayo clinic and others about you know hearing does tend to uh, degrade over time and of course all this you know every apple is different you know and so it depends on the size of your tumor its location is it close to the cochlea or farther away from the cochlea does the cochlea get a high dose or not, you know, all those things are taken into consideration when you're planning a radiation plan and, and when you're treating the tumor. So it's hard to answer that question um, all in one, as you know, and you can have perfect hearing preservation, your best surgery, the stars are aligned, the team was on their game, patients, you know, factors were very favorable, perfect tumor, and then a month later lose the hearing for some other reason, viral or, or maybe some inflammatory process. Uh, and, um, um, you know, there's just a lot of things are beyond our control, even though we do everything that we know how to do. And we listen to every talk and go to every meeting and read every paper and try to incorporate that into our skill set. Um, it's still possible to lose hearing after saving it. Well, and I think that's probably why the question is continues to be asked because it's just it you hear, I mean, on our end, we hear so many different things from so many different places about so many different procedures. And, um, you know, I can imagine for patients, again, that's just something that is hard for them to decipher what, what to believe, what's real, what, and I think, I think it's probably a lot of it is true. It's just different in every situation. And that is so much what makes treating acoustic neuroma difficult. Um, we are about at the end of our time today. We've covered almost all the questions. So I really wanna thank both, um, both of you for taking the time today to present this information. We have tons of comments saying what a great presentation this is. Um, I think it's really, really helpful for patients. So I'm very grateful um, and our organization, we're very grateful to you both for taking the time to, um, to present this information and then to stick around and, and answer all these questions. Thank you. I mean, it's really a, a wonderful opportunity. Really appreciate it. So great. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you both. And I hope you all have a great afternoon. Take great. care. You too.
Bye. Bye now.